Good afternoon. Thanks for coming out, uh, everyone. It's wonderful to see people in Ream Library, even if uh, all of you but me for the moment are, are masked. It's been about a year and a half. We did some great events online, uh, including one that Congressman McGovern joined us for, but it's great to be uh, here back in Ream Library, and I'll extend a, a welcome to the people who are watching us on YouTube or will watch us uh, in, in the future there. My name is Tom Landy. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture. Uh, at Holy Cross. And the McFarland Center sponsors and supports programs that explore basic questions of meaning, morality, and mutual obligation. As we gather today, we recognize two anniversaries, uh, one far mo more momentous than the other, uh, the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, uh, and a second smaller one, in a sense, but significant in the life of Holy Cross. Uh, today is the 20th anniversary of the McFarland Center. Uh, we were uh, graced with that name later, the McFarland Center. Originally, we were the Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture. And uh, this building was actually dedicated shortly after that to give uh, Ream Library, uh, give us our home here. The Center's inaugural conference was scheduled for September 14th, uh, 2001, a few days after the attack. And uh, the title of the conference was called Toward a Deeper Understanding of Forgiveness. As we rationalized going forward with the conference, what to do in light of that, and everyone couldn't fly in, it was quite a frightening time. Um, uh, in the wake of the tragedy, we thought about it, and I recalled in a volume that we published later of the, uh, uh, to commemorate the conference, and I said this, none of us could have imagined that only days before the conference, anything as horrific as the suicide attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon would occur. The loss, the disorientation, the anger that we all felt, radically raised the stakes for a conference about forgiveness. The Boston Globe even questioned uh, whether it was appropriate for us to talk about forgiveness in the wake of such a brutal attack of terrorism. We believe that it was all the more important to talk about it at such a moment. If forgiveness meant anything, we reasoned, it had to mean something not only in trivial or mundane circumstances, but also at times when our beliefs are most sorely tested. The attack was a moment that tested whether liberal arts inquiry really had any capacity that we claim to understand, help understand the world. We certainly didn't imagine that day would lead to two wars, two, uh, two decades, trillions of dollars spent fighting terrorism and nation building in the Middle East. 20 years later, we at Holy Cross still set out to understand the world a world that is now reckoning with 20 years of war and military policy that has seemed at times precipitous, amorphous, and stuck. We're here today to think about the legacy of war over those 20 years, uh, and I'm grateful to Congressman Jim McGovern, who's such a great friend and supporter of Holy Cross, uh, who actually came back on the 10th anniversary afterwards. He was telling us he still has the poster from that uh, in his office. 
uh, and to Professor Ward Thomas, who are going to help us uh, think about that legacy. Uh, certainly the confusing events in the final weeks of the withdrawal from Afghanistan, but also the 20 years before that. Massachusetts Congressman Jim McGovern has been a leading critic of U.S. military policy in Afghanistan, coordinating bipartisan initiatives focused on the human and financial costs of war, proposals for safely withdrawing U.S. troops from the country, and promoting a political solution in Afghanistan and the region. We've invited him here today to help us make sense of the war in Afghanistan, the decision to withdraw U.S. troops, and where we go from here. What obligations do we have to the Afghan people, to those displaced by our actions, to our U.S. service members and veterans? Representative McGovern is a Democrat from Worcester, representing Massachusetts' second district, first elected to Congress in 1996. He is currently chair of the House Rules Committee, a senior member of the House Committee on Agriculture, Subcommittee on Nutrition and Oversight, chairman of the Congressional Executive Commission on China, and Democratic co-chair of the bipartisan Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. I'm grateful to him for his time here today, and to Jamie Hogue, our Director of Governmental Relations at Holy Cross, and a former legislative aide to uh, Congressman McGovern for his help always along the way. I'm also grateful to uh, my friend and colleague, Professor Ward Thomas, uh, who I've asked to lead a conversation with Congressman McGovern. Ward has been a faculty member in the political science through more than those 20 years. It's hard to believe looking at him, but he has been here that long. Uh, his scholarly work focuses on the ethical and normative aspects of international security. He's author of The Ethics of Destruction, Norms and Force in International Relations, published by Cornell University Press, among other works. And he teaches courses on international security, strategic studies, international law, U.S. foreign policy, international institutions, and ethics in international relations. We've received some questions in advance from the audience, uh, which you hope we'll be able to address. Uh, and we'll invite questions from the physical audience in the room a little bit later. So Professor Thomas, uh, when he's ready, he'll ask you to come forward to that microphone. And we need to, in COVID times, ask you to do that that way, to ask questions and then to leave your mic on. But we can uh, have our two speakers who are distanced uh, take their masks off. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Ward Thomas and Professor and Jim McGovern. Well, uh, let me echo that note of thanks, and uh, again, just to sort of explain the format. Uh, uh, the community was invited to submit questions online, and I've collected the questions that were submitted. Uh, several good questions, all submitted by students, and uh, we will start with those, and uh, when we get to the end of those, I will let you know and then invite uh, those who are present to uh, approach, approach the microphone. I think I'm in Congress, I should be able to figure out how to do a mic, but uh, anyway, thank you, Tom. Um, mm. So the first question um, that was submitted was submitted by uh, Charlie Roberts, a uh, senior in the class of 2022. Um, and the question is as follows. Given the U.S. experience in Afghanistan, it appears that we did not learn our lesson from Vietnam. In your eyes, is there any way to ensure that the country learns from the war in Afghanistan and does not get caught up again in long nation-building wars? Well, that's a very good question. And first of all, let me just say how honored I am to be here at Holy Cross. And Tom, thank you. And Ward, thank you. And Jamie, thank you for um, inviting me here today. And as Tom mentioned, um, as I was leaving my office in Worcester to come here, I, there's a, I have a framed poster of, of an event I did here 10 years ago uh, in this very library uh, with a, a, a a former Marine captain uh, named Matthew Ho, who was also a Foreign Service officer. And um, he resigned from the Foreign Service over 10 years ago in protest uh, to our policy in, in Afghanistan. But the, uh, the, uh, the, the title of the lecture at that time was Afghanistan, 10 Years of War, Costs um, and um, uh, Consequences and um, a Way Out. And, um, and here we are 10 years later, and we, finally, uh, we are finally uh, out of that war. But look, I'm, I was a history major in college, and I wish everybody spent a lot of time 
learning history because uh, if we had more people with a sense of history, maybe we wouldn't say, make the same mistakes over and over and over and over again. When you look back uh, on the Vietnam War and you read some of the um, accounts from supposedly the best and the brightest who helped, helped lead us into that war, I mean, they admitted things like they didn't know very much about the country. They didn't know very much about the culture. They didn't know very much about the hopes and the aspirations of the people. Uh, they didn't know much about the geography. Uh, and yet we plowed into this war in Vietnam, uh, which went on for quite some time. And in much the same way, we did the same thing in Afghanistan. You know, when after 9-11, uh, and we, you know, sell, we all commemorated that, som that, that horrific day, the 20-year anniversary just this weekend, um, that there was a decision made that we, need to, we needed to hold to account those who were responsible for the terrible you know, bombings of the World Trade Center, um, as well as the attack on the Pentagon and, uh, and all the horrific uh, and terrible and tragic uh, deaths that occurred that day. And, and I think a lot of people, when we voted for the authorization of the use of military force thought that is exactly what we were going to do. We were going to go after Al-Qaeda, the people who were responsible for planning and executing that terrible attack. Uh, but what happened was we did that and then the mission morphed into something different and then we got into nation building and then you know the, the mission changed every few years and no one quite knew what the end game was and what is the ultimate goal. And we ended up, even after we got Osama bin Laden, we're still in Afghanistan and now we're saying we're not fighting Al-Qaeda, we're fighting the Taliban and you know, we are going to create a, 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 a more democratic, uh, more inclusive country. And I think one of the lessons that uh, we hopefully will learn is that, uh, you know, uh, this notion that the United States can nation build uh, by using its military um, doesn't work. That's, uh, that's not how nations change. That's not how nations evolve. Uh, and the other thing we needed to learn, we should have learned in Vietnam, that if you're ever going to go into a military uh, conflict or a war, you have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It has to be a clearly defined mission. And we didn't really have a clearly defined mission in Afghanistan, right up until we left. I, I, if you would have asked me, like, what is the mission in Afghanistan? What is our ultimate goal? What is the, how do we know when we've succeeded? I couldn't answer that question for you. And when I visited Afghanistan on many occasions, a lot of the troops that I talked with uh, couldn't answer that question. A lot of our commanding officers couldn't answer that question. Uh, and so, um, so I think if we were better students of history, um, we would have learned the lessons of Vietnam. We would have asked more questions. Uh, the other thing, and I'll end with this, is that um, we are not very good. We're very good at starting wars. We're not very good at ending wars. And I think Lyndon Johnson had a great line. He said, you know, it's easy to get into war. It's hard as hell to get out of war. And, um, and you know, we passed these authorizations for the use of military force you know, for, in response to a particular crisis. And in this case, it was, you know, the aftermath of 9-11. But then there's no sunset on them. They just kind of, they go on and on and on and on. And I think one of the things I'm working on right now with Democrats and some Republicans is ways to change that. So if we ever find ourselves in a similar situation in the future where we want to authorize the use of military force, there has to be a sunset, which would force a debate and would force members of Congress to go on record as saying, yes, I want to continue it, or no, I want to end it. We have to end these wars that, you know, basically run on automatic pilot. Uh, Congress needs to reclaim its constitutional duty of, one, over, deciding whether we go to war or not, but making sure that um, if we stay, that it is what Congress wants us to do. It's what the American people want us to do. So um, yeah, there's lots of lessons about Vietnam that we should have learned that we didn't learn. There are lots of lessons about Afghanistan that I hope we learn. 
Um, and I, I saw an article uh, someone sent me on the way here. It was in, in Politico. It said 20 years of failure. You know, uh, you know, t you know, two days of of, uh, of oversight, essentially, that, you know, it would be a terrible tragedy that in the, if in the aftermath of this war that we decide not to talk about it anymore and we decide not to really examine what we did over the last 20 years uh, and just kind of move on and make believe, oh, it's the past, let's go on. I know it's sometimes painful to do and it's uncomfortable to do, but we really need to have that thorough uh, an honest discussion about our involvement over these last 20 years. Uh, so let me move into the next question, and in light of what you've just said, uh, sort of push it a step further. I mean, Josh Ashkenazi, uh, a freshman, um, asked, what, uh, what do you think we, the United States, could have done differently over the years to avoid the present outcome, and I guess I would push you in the direction of, of answering it. So the United States goes in in the fall of 2001 to root out Al Qaeda and in the process of doing so to take down the government that provided it with, with support. Um, was there any particular point at things went wrong, uh, at which you think things went wrong and would you have a problem with the narrative that says, well, once the United States went in and deposed the Taliban, there was some obligation to install in its place or to leave behind in its place something better, something more effective, perhaps something more enlightened? Yeah, so um, the problem is it's not our country, right? So to go in and say the United States is going to put in a government that is good for you without the buy-in of the people who live in that country, um, that's not a good way to do things. It doesn't work. Uh, you know, the idea that somehow we could create a Jeffersonian type democracy in Afghanistan, uh, well, again, if you read your history, um, you saw, you know, how difficult it was for other countries to try to manage Afghanistan. Uh, the former Soviet Union, for example. You go all the way back to Genghis Khan, all right? And um, so the, the notion that someone you go in and say, okay, we're going to overthrow your government, we're going to depose your government, and here, we're going to put this government in place, and we're going to all live happily ever after. Uh, countries are more complicated than that. And, um, you know, and at the end of the day, uh, you know, when we finally left, I mean, the government basically ceased to exist in, in 11 days. Well, think about that. You know, uh, 20 years of U.S. support, 20 years of training, providing some of the, you know, most sophisticated military equipment that exists, um, providing direct assistance to the, to the government, all that. And the first person to leave the country was the president of the country, President Ghani, with a you know, bag full of U.S. tax dollar money. Um, and then everybody else kind of laid down their arms because they saw what was going on. You know, we, we have spent over $2 trillion uh, in Afghanistan. That's a conservative estimate. And just to kind of put it in perspective, Americans owe $1.6 trillion in student loan debt. And so for the cost of the war in Afghanistan, we could have wiped out every single American's student loan bill. So that's, that's the enormity of our investment. And after all that investment, after all that training, and by the way, after all the lies that some of our military commanders told members of Congress and the American people that things were going swimmingly, and within 11 days, it's all over. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we need to do some reflection on what just happened. And again, it can't just happen in one or two hearings. We need to do some serious reflection. I, I don't know, um, you know, I, 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 could, I could understand going after Al-Qaeda and trying to hunt down Osama bin Laden because of what happened on September 11th. But beyond that, I mean, transforming Afghanistan, changing Afghanistan, you know, creating a different kind of government in Afghanistan um, that somehow we were going to help put in place, that we were, I mean, we're, 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 we're not indigenous to Afghanistan. Uh, we were viewed by many in Afghanistan as occupiers. 
I mean, and one of the things we should also learn from history is countries don't like foreign troops, you know, in their countries. And um, it, it builds resentment. And, um, and we really didn't give people, quite frankly, a, 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 a good option. At the end of the day, it was the Taliban or it was the status quo, which was one of the most corrupt governments on the planet. And we tolerated it. And a lot of U.S. taxpayer dollars you know, were stolen by, corrupt, by, the, by the government and by the military there, saying that they were going to take the money and pay soldiers. They took the money and put it in their pockets. Right? Um, so those are your cho and, 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 and continued U.S. presence. Those are the two options. And it appears that many in Afghanistan chose the Taliban. Not because I think they all think the Taliban's great, but if those are your options, um, you know, and you had to make a choice, I think that's what ended up happening here. And so I don't, I, I mean, the, the idea, you know, some people say, well, if we didn't go to war in Iraq, which I hope, I wish we never did, I voted against that war in Iraq, but if we didn't go to war in Iraq, maybe we could have focused more time on Afghanistan. But I still think you get to the same question. Can a foreign government, in this case the United States, basically create an alternative government uh, in a country that is not our own um, and have it be respected and have it work. And, um, and so I, I don't know, you know, I mean, I think, what, 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 I think we should have left Afghanistan a long, long, long time ago um, when the original mission was completed. And I think it was a mistake to think that we could somehow determine uh, the future of Afghanistan. I'm not, so I'm not saying that everything that we did was, was, was not well-intentioned. I mean, you know, investing in, you know, in trying to uh, help create, you know, more rights for women and others who desperately wanted uh, more rights. I think that, that is a noble, uh, a noble investment, uh, you know, helping start, uh, yeah, Af uh, Afghans start small businesses and helping you know, provide technical assistance to farmers. All that stuff is, I think, is very, very good. Um, but um, but I, think, uh, I, I think sometimes our foreign policy is, I think for lack of a better word, arrogant, well-intentioned, but sometimes arrogant. And I think, you know, I think we just, we, ju we misjudged here. Do we have responsibilities to the Afghan people after 20 years? And let me ask particularly about two sort of subsets of the Afghan people. First, those who might have cooperated with the United States either you know, in, in the role of providing intelligence or interpreters um, or perhaps more, less actively, more, more tacitly. And the second group, Afghan girls and women who were not I mean, at the very least, likely to be deprived of rights and, and opportunities in the government that, that now exists? The answer is absolutely yes, right? Um, I was talking to the mayor of Worcester today. I was at an event earlier, Mayor Joe Petty, um, and we were talking about the fact that Worcester is going to welcome um, a number of Afghan refugees here um, in the very near future. And we should do that. And we are... We were, we were glad to have them become part of our community. And that should happen all over this country um, and in other parts of the world. So yeah, we do. People who worked for us, uh, who were translators, uh, you know, they face dangers right now because of their affiliation with us. We ought to do everything we can if they want to leave to help assist them and get them to safety. Uh, we ought to continue to um, engage the new government uh, on the importance of not turning back the clock on the rights that have been won by many women, mostly in the urban areas of, of Afghanistan. Um, and if those women or those activists who fought for human rights feel that their lives are in, je are in jeopardy, we ought to be negotiating now to get them out. Uh, and to get them to safety, um, and um, you know, and and we will, ha and we will, we and the world community are also going to have to have some conversations about humanitarian aid uh, to regular people in Afghanistan, people who are not associated with 
you know, the old government or the, or the new government, uh, but just people who, I mean, war and conflict does a number on economies and, and infrastructure, and there are lots of people um, who are in danger of being, going hungry. I mean, we need to make sure that humanitarian assistance gets to people. So when I talk about ending our, the war in Afghanistan, I don't, I, I, I don't mean at all that we should turn our backs on the Afghan people or not care about human rights or not care about whether people are hungry. Um, I think we do. I think we ought to care about it not only in Afghanistan, but quite frankly, we ought to be, care about it all over the world. I think if, if more of our foreign policy were focused on things like alleviating um, hunger and extreme poverty, uh, you know, maybe the world would be a little bit more secure. Uh, and um, so, um, so I will, you know, we're working right now with the Biden administration to try to figure out, you know, again, how to accommodate all the refugees, but also uh, to get a commitment that uh, we're not going to ever stop helping people who want to leave uh, from having the ability to leave. Uh, the next question comes from Jackson Everts, who is a freshman. Who is responsible for the American lives lost in the Kabul airport bombing while the United States was in the process of pulling out of Afghanistan? Well, ISIS-K is, what, is, who, is, um, who, is uh, who is responsible for it. Um, and, um, you know, and I, um, and, and, and you look at our, our, our hearts ache uh, for the loss of life uh, by that terrorist attack. And, you know, and their families uh, of those who lost their lives will always continue to be in our prayers. Um, but, um, you know, this particular group uh, is also an enemy of the, of the Taliban. Um, and so, um, you know, their interest was in trying to make things as chaotic and as disruptive and as awful as possible. And what they did, um, you know, was horrific, the whole world was horrified by that. So, um, so they, are, they are the ones who are responsible for the bombings and, um, and the attack. And, um, but um, those, uh, servicemen, those service members who lost their lives you know, helped get countless thousands of Afghans out of the country. I mean, I mean the success of the airlift uh, is unequaled. Uh, uh, and, um, and those rescue missions continue uh, to this day. Let me um, follow up in the vein of focusing on the last weeks of mm -hmm. U U.S. involvement in, uh, in Afghanistan. It, you mentioned these are bitterly partisan times. Um, there was almost some semblance of bipartisanship in some criticism of the president about a month ago. I mean, it was hard to find too many people who didn't have at least something critical to say about how the Biden administration handled the end game. Uh, do you think that criticism is fair? So, look, we should always be open to oversight and review and figuring out what could we have done differently. I mean, are there things that we could have done that would have made it less chaotic? But I got to be honest with you. Um, I think Joe Biden did the right thing by ending U.S military involvement uh, in Afghanistan. I support him. I, I, as I, again, 10 years ago, I was here advocating the same thing. Even before that, I was advocating that we leave Afghanistan. Um, and I find it, I was listening to some of the hearings today, and again, Washington is a very polarized, partisan place, and it drives me nuts. I'm sure it drives you even crazier when you watch this stuff. But it's a little bit hard to stomach, you know, some of these people who are focused on the last month with a critical eye. And my question is, where the hell were you for the last 20 years? Where were you when we were funneling, you know, trillions of dollars to one of the most corrupt governments in the world? Where were you when we, we knew of the corruption within the ranks of the Afghan armed forces? I mean, where were you, um, you know, as, you know, our brave men and women who serve in uniform were sacrificing their lives, people were wounded, people have come home traumatized by, by what they have, what they witnessed. Where were you then? Where was the oversight then? So I get it, you know, ending wars 
you know, it's, 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 it's never easy. It's oftentimes messy. But when I look at what happened uh, in the last month, I don't, I mean, who would have, I mean, I, I knew the government of Afghanistan was no good and corrupt. I knew the military, you know, was deeply flawed in Afghanistan. But I didn't expect them to just kind of collapse in 11 days. Um, but they did. And I think that was not anticipated. Uh, but having said all that, they got thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people out. Um, and they continue to get people out. Uh, and so, you know, we're, in, we're ending our U.S. military involvement in Afghanistan. We are now trying to make sure that those who want to get out and get to safety can get to safety. And, I, you know, and I, and I think that was pretty successful. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know what people were expecting as to how this war would end or how any war ends. I mean, you know, people just don't stand up and hold hands and sing Kumbaya and that's the end of it. I mean, you know, this was a, a, a brutal war that went on for 20 years. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, it was chaotic. And, and if there was a way to make it less chaotic, Congress ought to do its oversight and you know, we ought to learn from those lessons. Just as we ought to have learned from the lessons of Vietnam, we have to learn from the lessons of the last 20 years. Let's learn from, you know, what could have been done better in this exit strategy. And whatever those lessons are, in the future, let's not repeat those mistakes. Um, or, or maybe the decision is, I'm, you know, they couldn't have anticipated this. But I, I, I got to tell you, I, I just, the, the people who are yelling and screaming and like, where have you been for 20 years? Um, you know, where were you when Matthew Ho, uh, 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 a captain in the Marines, was here in this library and he resigned his foreign uh, service uh, job in protest? Where were you when he was telling you the truth about what was happening there and the corruption and, then, and, you know, and the brutality and how our military leaders were not being straight with Congress uh, and with the American people? So, um, you know, we, we can, um, you know, uh, we ought to learn from you know, the, the, any mistakes we've made, but let's not limit it to a review of the last month. Let's look at the last 20 years. Um, Thomas Keen, a sophomore, economics and nation studies major, asked a question, much of which you've answered, but let me uh, just highlight one aspect of it. Do you in any way regret your vote to authorize military force in 2001? Would you do the same thing under the same circumstances? I do. I do. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's like the one vote I, w I wish I could take back. At the time, um, I thought it was the right vote because I actually believed what I was being told, that this was an attempt to go after Al-Qaeda and to hold them accountable for what happened on September 11th. I thought that was an appropriate use of military force. And I, I, I asked that question over and over and over and over again of Don Rumsfeld and others who came to testify. Um, and, you know, it turned out that I didn't, I didn't, it was, I didn't get the, 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 I didn't get the straight truth about what was going on. Maybe they didn't realize that it would morph into something bigger. But if I, if I, if I knew then what I know today, or what I knew 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, or even 18 years ago, I would have voted no. I would have joined Barbara Lee and voted no. Um, and I realized pretty quickly that uh, mission creep was going on here, that this, that this was morphing into other things. And, um, and so I quickly became a very strong critic of our military involvement in Afghanistan, trying to introduce resolutions to end, uh, to, to repeal the AUMF, to force Congress to vote on an exit strategy uh, or to stay. And uh, obviously he was unable to get the votes to be able to do that over the years. But, um, but what I, you know, and, and so when they decided to go to war in Iraq, um, you know, I, I approached it um, with, a, I approached all my briefings much more skeptically. Um, and, um, you know, and I, you know, fought very hard to 
prevent us from getting into another war. Uh, unfortunately, I, um, I wasn't successful, or the people who fought like me I didn't prevail on that. Um, and by the way, uh, you know, the war in Iraq was, uh, was a vote that included you know, not just Republicans, but a lot of Democrats as well. Um, uh, and um, I thought that was one of the biggest blunders that we've made in, uh, in modern history. Um, so, um, but I, you know, if you, if you would, to be very honest with you, I, um, if I knew then what I know now, I, w I wouldn't have voted the way I did. Could you speak more to Congress's role in oversight, Congress's role in foreign policy generally, but especially regarding the use of force? I mean, of course, there's this constitutional division of labor which seems tidy on its face. The president's the commander in chief. Congress declares war, but there's been no declaration of war since 1941, 42. Yet U.S. troops have fought many significant wars, and there seems to be much more deference to the president. Right, now. which is which is really dangerous. Um, and again, some of us, um, and it's not just Democrats, but I'm working with Congressman Tom Cole of um, Oklahoma, who sits on the Rules Committee with me, we're trying to reclaim congressional authority, or at least force Congress to do its job. Look, when it comes to war, Congress is pretty cowardly. I'm mean, going to be very blunt with you. Um, and we saw that in Afghanistan and even in Iraq. You know, once we went, we, no one wanted to talk about it anymore. No one wanted to vote on it anymore. Nobody wanted to do the oversight anymore. You know, just let it go, let it go. Um, and, um, you know, and, um, and, and, and in the aftermath of the Iraq war, which when people voted for the war in Iraq, it was enormously popular. I mean, I remember I saw a poll in Massachusetts where like, it was, it, was, it was like well into the 60s, this is when Bush first uh, said we, we were gonna go to war in Iraq. It was, it was, it was a pretty high number, percentage-wise, of people, even in this state, that were saying, yeah, I support President Bush in going uh, to war against Saddam Hussein. And I remember going to t town meetings and getting criticized for not you know, standing up to uh, Saddam Hussein and not supporting the president during this difficult time. Um, and then public opinion changed very rapidly. Um, and, um, you know, a year or two later, the, the poll numbers were reversed. Um, and, um, and you had a lot of members of Congress trying to defend their vote to go to war in Iraq. And it was very hard for them, I mean, to, to defend. And, um, and, uh, and so I think that, 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 that some of that right now is like, well, if I don't have to vote on it, then I won't be held responsible. And that's what I mean when I say cowardly. I get it, you know, I mean, issues of war and peace are very, very difficult. A lot of issues are difficult. But, I mean, you, you get elected to Congress to do, among other things, vote. And if you don't want to vote, Maybe you should do something else, right? But voting and, and, and living up to your constitutional responsibilities, I think is essential. And so some of us are trying to get us back to that, to, to set the ground rules, to tighten up the War Powers Act, to, to, uh, you know, to make sure that if you ever vote for the authorizations for the use of military force in the future, that they will be sunsetted. So that if you want to continue them, you have to debate and you have to vote to continue. And, um, and so I don't know how successful we're going to be on that, on that, but we've got a little bit of a, we have a bipartisan group trying to work on that. One of the very few bipartisan things that you can point to right now uh, in the House of Representatives, but I think it's important. And, um, and so, um, so, so all of us should demand that our members of Congress and our senators, you know, when it comes to war, take a stand. You know, I mean, vote, debate, do the oversight. Um, these committees that are, that are assigned with uh, oversight responsibilities, they're there for a reason, to make sure things are going well, or if things are going bad, to say, hey, they're going bad, change course. Uh, but, you know, our, our, our job is not to avoid the topic. And I, and I, I think, you know, for, you know, for a big chunk of 20 years, I mean, Afghanistan, 
notwithstanding the fact that we had men and women in our military sacrificing their lives uh, on behalf of this uh, uh, on behalf of this cause, but I mean, it, it, it was no longer front page news. You didn't hear about it on the news, and you certainly didn't hear it debated in Congress. And so I, I, I which prompted me and others to actually use the privileges of the House to force resolutions to the floor which would be tabled or, or dismissed um, you know, on ending the war just to get a debate, just to have an hour to debate, to actually say, look, there's a war going on and it's costing us a lot of money. I just told you what the cost was and what we could have paid for. We could have eliminated all, everybody's student debt could have been eliminated uh, and we still would have had money left to spare. And um, so, you know, this is a time for reflection. This is a time for discussion. And the discussion that I want to have is, yeah, if there are mistakes made, we need to acknowledge them. If Biden made mistakes exiting, let's acknowledge them, let's figure them out. How do we do it better? That's all, that's all important. But that to not talk about this in broader terms, to not talk about the 20 years, to not talk about Congress's role in this, or Congress's indifference in this, I think would be a mistake. Uh, and so um, I hope that, you know, maybe they, some have talked about getting a separate commission together that would be responsible to kind of do a holistic look at this. I think that would be a good idea. Um, but I don't know whether that will prevail or not. In that effort, how big a, uh, an obstacle do you see partisanship? I mean, do you, do you detect among fellow Democrats some hesitance to check the Biden administration on behalf of the institutional prerogatives of Congress? So, I, you know, I, I mean, it remains to be seen. Look, um, you know, I, I'm, a, I, I am, I'm a Democrat. You know, Joe Biden, I think, uh, has done a, good, a, a really good job, and I'm glad he's got a, he, he did what George Bush and what Barack Obama and what Donald Trump couldn't do. He, he ended our military involvement in Afghanistan. I'm glad that he did that. I think this war, I think it's a... I think most people want this war over with. And, you know, uh, and it was either that or let's continue this forever uh, at a very, very high cost. So, uh, but having said that, I mean, and, and let me also say, as somebody who lived through four years of Donald Trump, you know, there's not a day that goes by that I don't thank God that Joe Biden is in the White House and not the other guy um, because I think for a whole bunch of reasons, the world is in a, in a better place and our country has a, has a better future. Now, does that mean that I don't feel, that, that I, I won't criticize Joe Biden? No. I mean, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I, if, if, if he's making a mistake or he's doing something or did something that could have been done better, well, we need to call him out. For our own credibility, we need to call him out. I mean, I've criticized Joe Biden on a number of things. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in a, in a uh, we're in a, in a kind of a public um, confrontation now over U.S. policy toward Cuba. I think we should normalize relations with Cuba. He's, he, he's doubled down on the Trump policy in Cuba. It drives me insane. I can't believe, you know, we're doing the same old, same old, which has failed and hurt the Cuban people. But in any event, so I've been critical of him, you know, when I think he's doing something wrong. Um, but there's a difference between constructive criticism and just pure, unadulterated partisanship, you know, not interested in the truth or not interested in progress, but just interested in tearing people down. And I think that's, some of that is going on. I've listened to some of the hearings in the House and in the, and in the Senate today with uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken. And, um, you know, a couple of things that, are, that I come away with. One is Tony Blinken has a better demeanor than me because I, 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 at some point I would have said something that would have been inappropriate um, in front of both the House and the Senate uh, Foreign Affairs Committees because it got so, uh, to me, beyond the pale. But the other thing is um, that some of the criticism seemed less at getting to the truth or putting our national security interests front and center or trying to understand 
Afghanistan, you know, in historical perspective. And I think that's a mistake. I mean, I mean, hearings should be instructive. Um, you know, if you want to, if, if you just want to take pot shots, do a press conference, do a campaign rally. But in hearings, you know, we're supposed to be wanting to get to the truth. We are, we want to have a thoughtful discussion. We want to be able to to understand things. Um, and um, and I thought this was th these were more like mini press conferences. And you know, it is what it is. It's noise. And, um, and people forget about it in a couple of days. But I, don't, but I do think that there needs to be a, whole, a, a total review, not just of the last month, but of, but of the last 20 years. Um, probably was one of the questions submitted anonymously. Um, let me ask part of this, what is your view of the so-called Abraham Accords that normalized diplomatic relations between Israel and various Arabs, Arab states, including UAE and Bahrain, which was brokered by the Trump administration. Um, and do you see these as significant steps forward in terms of peace and security of the Middle East? So look, I, I want everybody to get along with everybody. And so, you know, relationship building is, is important. Um, but, um, you know, I think more attention needs to be focused on how we resolve the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Um, and, um, you know, because there, that is a conflict that, does, that needs to be resolved. So I think, I think some of the thinking of the Trump administration is that you could, you could isolate the Palestinians by getting other Arab countries to, you know, sign on to these agreements with Israel. Again, I have no problem with these countries signing on to agreements with Israel. But at some point, we have to solve the difficult questions. Uh, and you know the situation that the Palestinians face, um, you know, is um, you know is horrific, uh, and um, and you know we need to figure out a way to help get that resolved. Not just us, but the world community. Uh, you know, and it's getting more and more difficult because as Israel continues to expand its settlements, it becomes more and more difficult to kind of get this issue um, to a place where we can move beyond it. And so, um, so I, you know, I, you know, most of what the Trump administration did in foreign policy was calculated to do, to, to do something ultimately that I didn't like. Um, look, I want Israel to be safe and I want Israel to be secure. Um, and, you know, and I think that involves other Arab countries, you know, being part of, uh, of the, of the calculation. But, you know, we, we have to, we have to resolve the Palestinian crisis. Uh, I'd, I'd now invite members of the audience here in the library to ask questions of your own. Again, um, if you wish to do so, please come out to the aisle, approach the microphone, and make yourself heard as, as clearly as possible. Um, oh, let's Let's see. Oh, yeah. You're on. Um, so I just had a question about what our plan was for the military equipment that we left behind in Afghanistan, such as tanks and weapons. What, are, what was our plan on leaving that there, and are we planning on retrieving it so that they can't be in the hands of the wrong people? Well, much of it was destroyed. Um, and, um, you know, and I think, um, you know, what's remaining, I think, I mean, I don't know what the what the Pentagon um, has designed, but I think obviously we are not interested in having that um, be used against us. Uh, so, um, uh, but again, much of it was destroyed. You saw that um, uh, in the week before the, uh, the couple of weeks before the, the, the withdrawal. Um, and, you know, um, you know, and, and again, I, I hope, I mean, you know, again, we, we don't know what the relationship will be like with the Taliban. We don't know what they will ultimately, what their government ultimately will look like. We, we've seen their interim government, which is not particularly promising. Um, there are no women in the government, for example, but they tell us it's an interim government. We will see uh, what the future is, but, um, you know, but, and, and as to whether or not we can have a relationship with them. Um, and, um, but in the meantime, we are dealing with them and uh, in a way where we're able to continue these rescue flights. 
And so I think that's a positive development. Thank you. Yeah. First of all, thank you for speaking with us. Um, you mentioned how Kabul fell with, within 11 days, and I think that was uh, definitely shocking to everyone, but... Um, you, I'm sorry, could you lean into the mic just a little bit? And yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, um, I think it was shocking to everyone how fast Kabul fell, but I also think that, uh, you know, whether it was within a week or whether six months, as some reports were suggesting, it was pretty well known that um, the government of Afghanistan was going to fall to the Taliban right. when the U.S. withdrew. And, I guess my question is, do you think that the costs of that, knowing that in advance, were worth, were worth it being able to, in, in exchange for being able to say that we ended a forever war? Well, I guess the question is, uh, it goes back to you know, one of the reasons why a long, long time ago I was trying to end the war in Afghanistan. I think, what, it, what, it, what, is, what, is, the, what is our mission there? Um, and and if, is, is, you know, do you, I mean, again, we've spent trillions of dollars there. We've, Servicemen and women um, have lost their lives. Countless people have been wounded, um, and we were propping up one of the most corrupt governments um, in the world. And so, like, I don't know. I mean, do you want to do that forever? Or do you want to continue that? I mean, whether whether or not we end, whether or not we left today, or next year, or twenty years from now. I think you have the same result, um, and um, and again, I'm not indifferent to the plight of the people of Afghanistan. I think, as I said before, I think we have an ob a moral obligation uh, to try to be as helpful as we can. Uh, but I, I, I mean, you know, we started this war because we wanted to go after Al Qaeda and get Osama bin Laden. We did that, and then you know, th then this morphed into this nation-building effort that clearly didn't work. Um, I mean, I think it tells you a lot about uh, that government when the first person to leave was the president of, uh, of Afghanistan with a bunch of money. I was listening to Tony Blinken today, and he said that he talked to, they asked him, did you know that the president Ghani was, president Ghani was gonna leave? He said, well, no, I talked to him the day before he left. And he told me he was gonna be there and fight to the bitter end, and you know, and he was you know, prepared to, do whatever it took, and then the next day, he gets notification that he's on an airplane leaving the country. So, um, you know, I mean, one of my, one of the reasons why a long time ago I thought we should have ended this war is because of the corruption. And by the way, you know, uh, the human rights violations that were also being perpetrated by the Afghan um, government. So, um, so I, I, look, I, I think President Biden did the right thing. Uh, and I, um, again, I, if we could have do, done the exit better, I'm, I'm open to hearing how we could have done that better. We should learn from those mistakes if there were mistakes made. But I think he did the right thing. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, so one of the lingering questions amongst the veteran community within the past 20 years, especially recently with the fall of Kabul and or the fall of Afghanistan, as you said, in 11 days, what is the question of whether or not their service was worth it. I've seen many comments, one in particular, saying from a you know, fairly upset veteran that his service over the past, his 20 years of service since the 1990s to whenever he retired was all down the drain due to this one uh, action by the Taliban. Um, I guess my question would be, what would your response to them be? And are there any victories for these people on an individual basis that they can cherish? Yeah. Well, first of all, we honor the service of the men and women who serve in our armed forces. Um, and, um, you know, and I, and I can't stress that enough. And the men and women who serve both in Afghanistan, a war that I came to oppose, and the war in uh, Iraq, which I oppose strongly from the very beginning, I honor the service of the men and women who were deployed there. And we can never thank them enough. So let's, let's make that clear. Um, and, um, you know, and they're, I mean, the rescue mission, the thousands and thousands and thousands of people who were evacuated to safety, that, that happened not because of politicians, that happened because of the men and women who served in our armed forces who oversaw that rescue operation. 
Um, I mean, it was, it was an incredible success, what they did. Um, and there are countless stories uh, in which, you know, we, we can point to uh, actions by, uh, you know, our, our service, uh, um, men and women in our service who have, have saved lives, um, protected women. Uh, so we can go on and on and on. But I guess the, the, the counter question to that is, if you, if you find out that you are in a situation, let's like the one we're in Afghanistan, where you have a, a government that is corrupt, an Afghan military that is corrupt, um, I mean, is the answer to ask our men and women in the armed forces to remain there for, forever? to defend that. Uh, people who served in armed forces, you know, performed admirably. They did so at the request of the politicians. You know, they did their job. You know, the people who didn't do their jobs are the politicians. Uh, and so, you know, we, we, we need to honor uh, the, the service of those uh, in our armed forces, and uh, I will continue to do so. I'm proud of every one of them. Uh, when I was here 10 years ago, I was with a, a, a you know, a former Marine captain um, who was making the, the case very strongly at that point about the need to uh, end our military involvement. I remember a, a few years back when I was in Afghanistan, I met with a, with a uh, group of soldiers from Massachusetts who pulled me aside and said, you need to bring this to an end. Um, and. Um, and I'm glad we finally did, but um, they should be praised. Uh, you know, the, the, the critiques ought to be held for those who are responsible for coming up with the policy. And by the way, I would also criticize some of our military commanders who I think misled um, presidents and um, members of Congress and the American people, giving people, painting rosy pictures that really weren't there. So. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for uh, speaking with us today. I have a question about the military and its role in nation building, mm -hmm. particularly since Watergate, there's been a loss of confidence in a lot of public institutions, yet the military has retained a lot of its popularity. And in a lot of ways, it's absorbed a lot of responsibilities of other institutions, particularly the State Department. So when it comes to nation building, the military bit off more than it could chew in the Iraq and Afghanistan. So how is it the role of Congress to ensure that the military is held accountable uh, for its actions and for what it can do and what it can't do? Yeah, so again, I, I, I don't blame our military for doing what they were told to do by presidents and by Congress. I mean, that's, you know, so, um, but I think we have to learn that, you know, you know, nation building, you know, through military means doesn't work, all right? And in fact, we ought to be a little bit more humble about nation building uh, in general. I mean, life is complicated, countries are complicated. Um, I'm a believer that we ought to be committed to a high standard of, of human rights um, uh, in our own country and around the world. I co-chair the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission in Congress. Tom Lantos was the only Holocaust survivor who ever served uh, in the United States Congress. So, I mean, I mean human rights is, to me, should be the centerpiece of our, of our foreign policy. But I really think, and it's not just Afghanistan, and it's not just Iraq, I'm looking at a whole bunch of things that we are engaged with around the world. I think we need to, have a, we need to rethink a lot of things. Uh, one is, you know, you can't, you can't nation build militarily. Two, we have a sanctions policy, which I think uh, needs to be reviewed. Where we don't like you, you're our adversary. We, it, blanket sanctions, well, you may be the terrible leader of your country, but you're not going to suffer from those sanctions. Poor people are, average people are. Maybe we need to rethink our sanctions policy to make them more targeted at the people who are actually doing uh, the, you know, bad things. Um, you know, we, 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 you know we, we have to, we, we need some fresh thinking, we need some out of the box thinking, and I think now is the time to have that discussion. As I said before, I don't want you know, the, um, the discussion on Afghanistan to be two days of hearings. You know, I, 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 this is, we need to talk about this 
We need, we need, we need scholars to write about it. We need our military, um, you know, those who were deployed over there to give us their input. We need to listen to the diplomats. We need to listen to the Afghan people. Um, you know, why they ended up making the choices that they did. I mean, it may, it may be a little humbling for us to hear some of the answers, but, but it's like, you know, there's, we, we need a more, a more sophisticated and complicated and holistic discussion about uh, what our foreign policy should be. Uh, and I think we've learned in Afghanistan what doesn't work. Um, we learned that lesson before in other countries, but we learned it in Afghanistan most recently. Um, and let's figure out how we move forward, um, you know, learning from those mistakes and hopefully forging a more, uh, more constructive foreign policy. Thank you, Congressman. Yeah. Thank you very much for uh, being here. I just had a quick question about um, sort of the image of the U.S. abroad. So how does the withdrawal itself um, affect our credibility? Uh, particularly among our allies. Uh, you know, how can our allies trust us to stand by them now, particularly whether it be our friends in East Asia like Taiwan, um, when they see what we, having left, we have a track record of leaving our friends and allies behind, whether the Kurds or um, even Americans in Afghanistan. Yeah. So, I mean, but specifically with regard to Afghanistan, I, I, get, I get the question, counter question is like, well, what would you have us do? Stay there forever? I mean, and, and to prop up a corrupt government, and to support a corrupt Afghan military? Is that the, I mean, is, is, is that showing, you know, a, our allegiance to our allies? Look, um, I, I just, I, I, you know, and it's not just with Biden. By the way, Trump said he wanted to leave Afghanistan, he, and he made that clear. Uh, he didn't do it, but, you know, he put the ball in motion. Uh, Biden said he wanted to leave Afghanistan, and he did. So, I mean, the message to our allies is that we're going to keep our word. When we say we're going to leave, it's over, we're gone. We're leaving. Now, we're not going to abandon the Afghan people, but the military part of this has ended. And, you know, if you want to build stronger uh, alliances amongst our allies, maybe we need to start thinking a little bit differently about, you know, what we should be bringing to the table. I mean, I think this is an opportunity to build strong alliances all across the world, you know, to combat the climate crisis, for example. I mean, I mean, we are all feeling the ravages and seeing the ravages of the climate crisis. You know, this is something that we can actually strengthen our alliances uh, around the world with. You know, maybe we should be figuring out ways to um, combat hunger and um, extreme poverty around the world. Uh, maybe that is a way we can better strengthen our alliances. Uh, and by the way, when you talk about alliances, um, you know, we always talk about, you know, presidents and prime ministers and, you know, this leader and that leader. I mean, when I think about building alliances, yeah, I want to have good alliances with fellow politicians and leaders. It's really important, though, to have strong alliances with people. Um, and, you know, People around the world look to us uh, as an example. They look to us to do good things around the world. And when we don't, um, they get very, very disappointed. And I think that um, you know, th there are some things that we've done over the last 20 or so years that um, uh, have diminished our credibility in the world. You know, um, I was asked a question the other day about, you know, post 9-11, like what, you know, you know what, are the, what, what are the lessons, what, 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 what do you think, how do you think we reacted in the aftermath of 9-11? And I said, it, it, it's a mixed bag, right? I mean, there's some things that really stand out in my memory of, of, of how this nation came together, how the world came together. I mean, people lined up and gave blood, people, you know, I mean, they cheered on our, you know, um, yeah, first responders, they, 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 you know, we felt like we were, we were coming together. There were some things we did in, in government that I think we ought to reflect on a little bit. One was, you know, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, a limitation of our civil liberties with the passage of the USA Patriot Act. Um, I mean, it, you know, increases in our military budget. 
Now, we have a Democratic Congress. I'm, I'm happy for that. I get to be the chairman of the Rules Committee. But they're moving in, uh, we're moving in, uh, a, an, armed, an armed services, a national defense authorization bill forward that adds $24 billion to what Joe Biden requested for the defense budget. It's like, like really? Um, you know, is, is that how we're going to be more secure in the world? So, um, so I think, you know, I, I, I think we ought to rethink this definition of national security. Uh, it includes more than the number of bombs we have. Um, it includes the quality of life for people in this country, as well as the quality of life for people around the world. Nobody wants to be hungry. You know, people want to be safe. You know, people want to have a better future for their kids. I mean, we need to start thinking in those terms um, as a way to strengthen our, our uh, and, and, you know, and to protect our, and enhance our national security around the world. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, so I'm wondering if you envision a scenario in the near future, whether that's like the next couple months or years, that the U.S. would have to consider re-entering Afghanistan for like an ex another extended stay, and if so, is there any scenario that you would support re-entering Afghanistan? No, I mean, I, 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 I don't, I mean, I, you know, I, you know, I suppose, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't think that that's the way we should, I mean, I don't, re-entering Afghanistan, I mean, I, I suppose if there was a terrorist, you know, uh, you know, cell that, um, suddenly emerged, I mean, maybe that might be a re, might, um, you know, be cause for kind of an international response to that specific, you know, terrorist cell, but to go back in and to kind of occupy the country again, no, I don't think we, 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 we should, um, I don't, I wouldn't support that. Um, again, I, 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 I want to make sure we're supporting the Afghan refugees, I want to make sure we're supporting, uh, you know, uh, the safety uh, and the evacuation of those who want to get out. I support humanitarian aid. I want to make sure that the people of Afghanistan don't go hungry. Um, but to uh, to re-enter militarily, uh, to occupy that country, I, I don't think that that would be the right thing to do. Thank you. Thanks. Could I follow up on that on her yeah. behalf, yeah. maybe? Um, yeah. One of the main concerns about the United States leaving Afghanistan that's been expressed has been the possibility that the Taliban might again allow extremist groups to operate from Afghan soil that might threaten the U.S. and its allies. How worried are you about that? Well, there are extreme groups that are popping up all over the world, in Africa and other parts of the world as well. I mean, should we all go in and occupy all those countries too? Um, you know, I mean, if they get to a point where we believe that they are a direct threat to us, um, in a meaningful way, um, then we ought, then you know we, we have some options available to us. Uh, but um, the Taliban has said that they're not inter they, they didn't like Al Qaeda, um, they don't like ISIS K. I'm not saying that, that makes the Taliban nice. I'm just simply saying they don't like some of the people we don't like, uh, and we'll see how that all how that all works out. Uh, but you know, let's let's dispel the notion that somehow there aren't terrorist cells in other countries around the world um, that are thinking bad things. Uh, so yeah, we need to be prepared, but I'm just, I don't think that we should reoccupy Afghanistan or occupy a hundred other countries around the world. Thanks. All right, thank you for uh, coming to Holy Cross. It's really honored to have you here. Um, so I have a cousin who's very, I don't know how to answer him uh, because I'm not particularly a big China guy, but uh, it's probably um, too early to tell. And like you said, Afghanistan is not really our country. But um, I did read a couple of headlines. I did also uh, see that China, I think, sent like a $31 million in aid to the Taliban in Afghanistan. So my question, I guess, would be, um, it's probably, like I said, it's probably too early to tell, but is there some sort of immediate or long-term concerns from this situation in Afghanistan that would probably sort of strain our relations with China, whatever they may be? Well, first of all, China's sending money all over the world. I mean, they're, 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 they're trying to expand their influence around the world. They're, they're sending money to Central America, uh, various African nations. I mean, China is trying to use its um, you know, resources to basically, you know, control and have greater influence around the world. Um, you know, uh, and, um, 
And again, I think there's a case to be made that our foreign policy should be more toward, you know, let me just say, one of, my, one, one of the criticisms of, that I have of, of the aid that China sends is that it usually comes with a bunch of, you know, strings attached to it that really don't help some of the people who live in the country that, is, that are receiving the aid. But I really do think that there is a role for the U.S. in terms of expanding our foreign aid, in terms of, again, helping, you know, helping with things that, you know, whether it's technical assistance or, or, or combating hunger or extreme poverty, those are things that I think, you know, are worth us investing in. I might, let me tell you one little story, then we'll go back to China. I'm the author of a bill um, that um, called the George McGovern Robert Dole International Food for Education Program. It's basically a global school feeding bill. And um, George McGovern, who you read your history books, ran for president against Richard Nixon in 1972, lost 49 states but won Massachusetts. Um, you know, biggest, one of the bigger, biggest critics of the war in Vietnam. Anyway, was the ambassador to the Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome. I used to be a former intern for him. I'm with Congress. He tells me, I got this idea for a global school feeding program. Can we sell it to Bill Clinton? And we did. And anyway, today, that program has fed 44 million children in some of the poorest countries in the world. And it is a, an interesting program because it, is, it doesn't go to the government. It goes to NGOs to come up with uh, school feeding projects uh, that also have to have a special emphasis on getting more girls into school because in a lot of poor countries girls education isn't valued and then it has a component in which they have to become self-sustaining. Anyway, long story short, I'm in visiting a displaced persons community in Colombia. This is when George W. Bush was president and um, it was a really terrible slum, if you, uh, that's how I could describe it. And a young mother came up to me and the U.S. ambassador and introduced me to her 11-year-old son. And we were, by the way, we were, we were, we were visiting a McGovern Dole school feeding program in this slum. And this mom, mother comes up to us and says, uh, introduces us to her son and says, you know, every day one of the armed actors comes through this terrible place we live and approaches me, this 11-year-old boy's mother, and says, give me your son, let him join us. And if he does, we will give him what you can't give him. We'll feed him every day. And she says, I've come very close to giving up my son either to the FARC guerrillas or the right-wing paramilitaries because I couldn't feed my son. And now I don't have to make that choice because my son is being fed and he's learning how to read and he's learning how to write and maybe he'll be president of this country someday and help everybody who's poor. And I said to the ambassador, cable that back. Cable that, I mean, cable that back, that's it, right? And here's the deal. When you do things like that, when you invest our foreign aid in programs like that, people like you. And when they like you, they don't want to blow you up. I mean, parents are parents everywhere. Parents are the same, you know, whether it's in the United States or Haiti or China or, you know, Afghanistan or whatever. We, all, we love our kids. Our hearts ache when our kids don't have enough to eat, right? So, you know, we need to maybe think a little bit differently about that. Go back to China. My worry about China um, is, um, you know, is, is um, its increased militarism um, and its increased disregard for human rights. Um, look, I don't want to, I, I do not want a war with China. Um, and we're going to have to figure out how to work with them. And I think climate change is one area we might be able to find some common ground. But we also need to be insistent, you know, that we're not going to tolerate um, its horrific human rights record. So, for example, again, I'm against blanket sanctions because it hurts very people. But we, 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 should, we, 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 I, we should require that no U.S. businesses, you know, are getting parts of whatever it produces, whether it's clothing or footwear, wherever, you know, from the Xinjiang region in China where the Uyghurs are being put in concentration camps and we see a genocide going on. Um, you know, we ought to increase targeted sanctions on high-ranking Chinese government officials who are responsible 
for the crackdown in Hong Kong, for the ethnic cleansing of the Tibetans. Um, and we ought not to be having the Olympics in Beijing. I mean, I, at a minimum, we ought to postpone the Olympics. We postponed the Olympics in Tokyo for a year because of the pandemic. We ought to be able to postpone the Olympics for a genocide. Um, and if we don't, and if we continue to kind of have business as usual, you know, then like, again, we ought not, we, we, we lose moral authority to talk about human rights abuses in, in other parts, parts of the world. So I, I worry about China. Um, I think we have to have a combination of, of constructive pressure and engagement. Um, those who are rattling the sabers, um, quite frankly, I, I don't think, uh, I, I, I don't think that's constructive. And I don't want to go down that road, but we can impose consequences that hopefully might get them to change their behavior. Probably not as much as we want, but at least um, a little bit. And again, we, the, the International Olympics Committee, I mean, they ought to rethink where they're doing the Olympics. I mean, especially right now, when every major human rights organization, with the United Nations, where, you know, the Trump administration and the Biden administration are talking about the genocide against the Uyghurs. Like, how, how do we just go on? And, and if they go on with it, you know, the heads of these companies ought not to be showing up um, and, you know, like they do at all these Olympics. I mean, there, there has to be some, there has to be some accounting for what is happening there. Thank you very much. I noticed three more questioners in line. I would say that the timing should work out about perfectly. So uh, if you're not already in line, I'm afraid you'll probably run out of time, but I'd like to hear from the three of you. Okay, thank you again for coming. Um, earlier today, you mentioned how we need to continue our discussion of Afghanistan and keep learning from it in the future. Um, many people in my age group, like in this room or in general, have not, were not born yet during 9-11 or were too young enough to remember the events, and, but we still have grown up with this war. Does this change the way that you talk about Afghanistan with this generation, specifically as we reach voting age? And if so, how does it change your approach? Yeah, well, well first of all, um, I mean, you all have really good questions here. So I mean, I, 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 I think you know a lot more than some of my colleagues do about Afghanistan. So I. I, you all should run for Congress, um, so I hope that some of you will. Uh, look, um, you know, I, when I talk to college students, I mean, I, um, you know, I, I, ask, I ask you all to think about what kind of world you want. Um, and then when you figure that out, then you've got to figure out what's my role in achieving that. You know, I, I mentioned the, that I was a college intern for George McGovern. My first political experience was when I was in middle school in 1972, helping pass leaflets out for his campaign for president. And, um, and I was in seventh grade at the time, but as a seventh grader, I remember listening to him speak and talk about ending war. I, I, he, he talked about protecting the environment. He talked about ending poverty and ending hunger, and he talked about things that as a young middle schooler were appealing to me. I mean, I, the kind of world I want was what he was talking about. Now, again, he lost 49 states, but he did win Massachusetts, and I'll take credit for that. Um, but, he, um, but the bottom line is, um, you, know, um, you know, I decided I wanted to go into public service. I didn't know I was going to run for anything until later on, but um, but I thought this was a, this was the way for me to try to get that kind of world, and so um, you know when it comes to issues of, of war and military budgets, I mean I think you know the, I ask all of you, I mean where do you you know where do you want the limited resources that we have in this country? How do you want them spent? And I'm not naive. I know the world is dangerous. I know we have to be vigilant, we have to protect ourselves. But I mean, you know, I mean, our military budget is like so big, you know, I was gonna say even Dr. Strangelove is impressed, but that you would probably haven't seen that movie. So that's, I'm dating myself. Um, <laughs> but I mean, but, but the point of the matter is, is that, um, you know, I, I tell people budgets are moral documents. They reflect what we believe and what we value. 
And it, it has been very disappointing to me that so many of our budgets have been heavy on militarism and light on investing in people, whether it's here or in poor countries around the world. And, and I think, you know, you know, whether we, what direction we move in is going to depend on, you know, what your generation decides is important. I mean, we, everybody says they care about the climate crisis. Absolutely. I mean, we, we're all seeing, you know, these, the, the impact of, of the climate crisis. Yet, we, yet our budget doesn't reflect the magnitude of the problem. And so we, 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 we need to develop the political will to, to change that. You know, I do a lot of work on hunger and food insecurity. I tell people all the time that hunger is a political condition. And people, what are you talking about? No, it's a political condition because we have the money, we have the food, we have the infrastructure, we have everything we need to end hunger in the United States and quite frankly around the world, but we don't have the political will. We have the political will for a tax cut to help billionaires and big corporations. We have the political will to go to war. We have the political will to increase our military budget above what the president's even asking for. I mean, like, so, um, you know, I would just tell everybody here, uh, we, we began with this, read your history um, and learn from history. Um, I remember when I majored in history, my father was like, what the hell are you majoring in history for? Why aren't you getting a degree in business? Why aren't you being a lawyer? Why aren't you being a doctor? I'm like, I don't know, I just kind of like history. Well, you know what, I'm glad I did. Um, it helps you with your reading, writing, and comprehension skills, but if you have a little bit of a sense of history, you can learn from past mistakes, and you can also learn from past success stories. And I think when, as you learn about Afghanistan, and books are gonna be written, I mean, um, just as like I learned about Vietnam from a lot of the books that were written after, after the war, I mean, we, the test is whether or not we're going we're gonna to take those lessons seriously and conduct ourselves accordingly. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Um, but I, I just wanted to ask, that because uh, part of the um, accountability that I'm held to is that if I turn a paper to my freshman history professor with just the biggest key phrases and you know hot button for, you know words that i can think of and throw them into a paper in an incoherent manner i'm going to get an f and they're going to tell me exactly what i did wrong and then furthermore if i lie about certain facts and make things up on that paper there are clear and defined consequences for when i do those things and i can be upwards of expelled from the college for doing stuff like that Yet our military is able to do things like, you know, just throw millions of dollars of advanced equipment at, uh, you know, Afghanistan and of course other um, developing countries where we're trying to nation build. And these things quite literally sit in airfields or garages and rust. And, you know, there's no accountability for the raw materials that we're just providing to these people with no structure. So I'm wondering, you know, you mentioned our you know, $725 billion annual military budget. Um, and the fact that, you know, le uh, military uh, leaders have lied to legislators, but then those legislators who are responsible for oversight are failing in their job as well. More simply, how, like, what are some concrete ways that you can think of that we can correct these financing issues both in wars and our military in general, but also in a more nuanced way? How do you think we can ensure accountability in our military specifically. Yeah. So, yeah, so when you begin your question, I thought when you were saying that, you know, if you speak in incoherent sentences and you lie and you come up with hot button phrases, you get an F, but yet you can, run, you can win the presidency. Yeah, uh, by doing, I, that, I, that, is that well. was the point you were trying to make. Um, the, uh, look, so the accountability is with the politicians, all right? So we vote for the military budget. We vote to increase it, or we vote to cut it, or we vote to keep it level funded. And so the, the, what, 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 what needs to happen um, is that people who care about this stuff need to pay attention to how their elected officials vote. I mean, I, mean, I, I, you know, I know this sounds kind of simple and basic, but it is the reality. I mean, the, the defense industrial complex 
is huge. I mean, they have, you know, I mean, we, every state has, you know, uh, companies that make weapons and military equipment. So, I mean, there's constituencies. They all have lobbyists. They all write out big pack checks. And if you want to run for Congress, you got to raise a lot of money. I mean, that's just the way, the way it is, right? And so, you know, you have some politicians who go along to get along. You know, I want to make, you know, I, I've got a big defense contract in my district. They're raising money for me. You know, I, I don't want to explain to the workers, you know, oh, I'm, you know, I'm cutting the military budget. Not because I want you to lose your job, but maybe I want you to take that expertise that you are using to make weapons of destruction and turn it toward maybe, maybe doing something to deal with climate change or something that is good, right? Um, you know, but oftentimes people don't make that connection. You know, and um, I, I, you know, I've, I've sat through a bunch of these 9-11 um, ceremonies over the years, and um, you know, and I like the, you know, and again, forgiveness is, when you talk about something so horrific, is always kind of controversial, but I always tell people that love is stronger than hate. I mean, that's, at the end of the day, we need to be guided by that, right? And yet, so much of what you hear, you know, um, is about, you know, the need for us to arm up more. Well, we're, we're, we're the most well-equipped military. We have more weapons, we have more nuclear weapons than anybody. We can destroy the world over and over and over again. I mean, how much more do we need? Um, and so the accountability has to be with the politicians. Um, and, you know, and it's not just about wars, it's about arms sales. Why the hell are we selling arms to Saudi Arabia? I mean, a country that disrespects women, uh, a country that has lots and lots and lots, countless numbers of uh, political prisoners, a country that has taken some of our military, you know, sophistication that we have given to them and used it in a war in Yemen where they've bombed school buses and weddings and innocent people have, have been killed. And a country that, by the way, uh, assassinated and dismembered a Washington Post journalist, and then we don't even know where his remains are, right? And yet it's like business as usual. Like, I mean, at some point, we have to start saying, is, 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 is that in our, how does that serve our national security interests? So look, you know, I'm a Democrat, I'm in charge of the Rules Committee, and you know, I'm, I want to be supportive of all of the stuff that comes out of Congress. I can't support the military budget that's coming out of the Armed Service Committee. It's too big. And it's even more than the President asked for. It's more than Trump asked for. So like, okay. Um, but for some reason, people, politicians think there is political advantage to saying that I will support a higher military budget because you will all think that I'm going to fight for you. I'm, that means I'm making you more safe. That means I'm taking the threat of terrorism more seriously. That means I'm tough on the bad guys. And it's, and it's not a new phenomenon. And it has, it has, I mean, you go back, read Dwight Eisenhower's farewell speech about the danger of the military industrial complex. I mean, it's just out of control. Um, so the accountability has to be at the ballot, but it has to be with politicians. So if you want the military budget cut, then you look at how your representative is, is voting, and you say, you know, did you vote? There'll be an amendment to cut the military budget, because I get to make those in order, and I'm making an order. I don't think it will pass, but how did you vote on that? If you want an increase, then you can look at who voted to, to increase the budget. I've often said if I introduced an amendment to cut the Pentagon's budget by 10 cents, it'd probably fail. I mean, you know, that's how ridiculous this is. But I just, I, you know, I, again, I go back, you know, when, when people talk to me about national security, I would say, Let, let's have a new definition of national security here in the United States. I mean, national security means, you know, whether we, you all have jobs, that, and you're on a livable wage, whether you have enough food to put on the table, whether you have adequate housing, you know, whether you have access to a good education, uh, whether, whether, whether you can breathe clean air and drink clean water, um, you know, I mean, those are things that are essential to national security. Um, and yet, you know, we are so hung up that, you know, we, it's all about how many bombs we have. 
Again, I'm not advocating unilateral disarmament. I'm just saying we got more than enough right now. Um, and we ought to be investing more in those other sources of national security. And I hope that that's what we will do in the, in the future. Thank you Thanks. very much. One more question. Thank you for being here. Oh, wait. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for being here today and uh, answering all our questions. Um, so under the Trump administration, Secretary Mike Pompeo met with members of the Taliban to discuss um, U.S. withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan. Do you think that if he instead met with members of the Afghan government, then things would have turned out differently? You know, I, again, I, I don't know. And, and I, 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 I rarely miss a chance to, like, say something not so nice about Mike Pompeo. But um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, look, at, I, I don't think this government, the Ghani government, um, you know, was worth very much, as evidenced by the fact that he was the first person to leave with the money. I also know, and our government knows, that not only his government, but his predecessor's government was horrifically corrupt. They were stealing money. And, you know, and we just kind of went along with it. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, maybe, you know, you know, could there have been a, you know, a, you know, an agreement to, you know, and there was, some, and, and, and Tony Blinken talked about this today about having conversations between the Ghani government and the Taliban about maybe doing some sort of thing where there'd be some representation of the current government in whatever the Taliban government was, but Ghani left uh, too soon. But I don't know whether or not, um, I, don't, I, I don't know whether or not um, the, the Afghan government was salvageable, period. Um, you know, I do know this, and I, 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 I don't wanna, I, I know I've said this before, I do know this, I feel that President Biden did the right thing. I think he did the right thing by ending our military involvement in Afghanistan. Uh, I think most people in this country um, wanted it ended. Um, I think the only justification that I've heard to kind of continuing investing trillions of dollars into the foreseeable future was to avoid a chaotic exit. And, you know, I, I, it's, We've sacrificed an awful lot. The people of Afghanistan have sacrificed an awful lot. Um, and, uh, but I think, we, uh, I think we did the right thing. So um, and let me just say to everybody here, I thank you for coming and thank you for the, good, the excellent questions. Uh, I, um, I have a great respect for this college uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and, uh, you know, I've... Um, I, I, I didn't get a Jesuit education because, uh, as I told Father Burroughs, who was here before, I got rejected when I applied. But, <laughs> but I, 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 when I, I, I did, um, I did uh, when I was a congressional aide, lead an investigation into the murders of six Jesuit priests and two women at the University of Central America in El Salvador. And so I felt I got a Jesuit education by spending a big chunk of almost two years investigating those murders. But I also had the privilege of being at many of the commemorations with Father Burroughs and other uh, uh, teachers and, and priests from, from Holy Cross and students from Holy Cross. Uh, and, um, but I like the mission of a Jesuit education which is dedicated to social justice uh, and to peace uh, and to creating a better world. And so um, I'm really in awe of all of you for being here. You, you, you are in a great place. Uh, and, um, and I hope that, uh, that uh, some of you might think seriously of running for office uh, at some point. Um, I know, I know you, you watch TV and it's like, ah, I don't want to do that, right? But, uh, but politics is the way you change things. Um, and um, we need good people to want to do this stuff. So in any event, thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you. Congressman James McGovern. Thank you, Congressman McGovern. Thank you, Ward. And uh, we'll mask you back up again just like normal. And uh, you're welcome to ask a question if you want to come up or just say thank you. But good night. <laughs>